Uh, we want to talk to you about something that is currently being tried in maybe 10 places around the country. There are some national grants for this. And uh, we don't know yet whether this is something that's useful or not. And I'll control this for you, Dwayne, if you want to, if you want to take over at all. All right. So there's actually some, some notes there that have questions if you're interested in asking Ooh. the audience. So like I could go to the back, the ones that are ready to take a nap. Uh, yeah, sure. Oh. Just don't stand in front of the camera because I want to make sure they get good pictures of me throughout. Uh, well, I mean, you think about it. Since nobody here is involved in community paramedicine, you think that there is a need for it in our region, in our state, Commonwealth. I'll get it eventually. Well, we didn't tell them what it was yet, though. We did. But that's OK. We can ask if they have but, a need I for mean, it. They can make predictions. First <laughs> off, do you think it has any chance of making it in Pennsylvania? If you look at the, uh, the little emblem, it's got orange in it. That's good for Pennsylvania, for pre-hospital providers, right? Everybody's got orange on their uh, patches now. But think about it. Well, except for my basic patch still doesn't have the orange on it. But Think about what a community paramedic could possibly do. Where would they fit? Start formulating your idea and then see how close it fits to here. Because you know what? There is no one definition. We'll kind of go over that and prove that. But uh, you know, the community's view of a, <coughs> of a paramedic, they see the vehicle. They see the red lights. They see somebody coming. Okay, and that, and yes, and then they all refer to us as ambulance drivers. That doesn't go away. It doesn't matter how many times they've been educated. We are all still just ambulance drivers. Don't worry about that. <laughs> I've gotten over it. 20 years of therapy, it helped. Well, you had to get over being an emergency physician, too. That's, like, well, what I've, the heck is that? That's ongoing therapy. Okay, okay, ongoing <laughs> therapy. <clears throat> all right, but for a community paramedic... Go back? Yeah, go back. Please. Go back, okay. How about that uh, little econo box down the right? Doesn't have big lights and the woo-woos, but you know what? It gets that provider to the patient. All right. And there's the patient. Where's the patient? The patient's at home. Where does the patient do the best if we keep them at home? And if you start thinking with that kind of a, of a model, what can we do, how can we build this to keep the patients in their homes. Oh, that makes me think of a question. Okay. How many people of you, how many people in this room think that 10 or 15 percent of the patients they see when they go on a run could actually stay at home with a little extra help? Anybody? Okay, so there's some people here who we might be able to sell this to. Yeah, I like it. But then you also have to look at it. Now think of it, all right, Everybody in this room probably remembers cassette tapes, maybe even some 8-track tapes. In other words, there's no kids in this room. There are no, and you know what? If you look at the current ability of electronics and the ability for telemedicine, this is a perfect segue for community, medicine, community paramedics to get out there because we can take the expertise of the physician that will oversee to the patient's house. But how are you going to fit a patient in that white thing? <sighs> yeah, that is a little... Uh, sit them up in the front. Let them hit the uh, lights once in a while. So maybe they don't need to be transported even. Ooh, heresy, heresy. <laughs> not transporting the patient? How many, how many would not want to transport all your patients? <laughs> Get them all up there. <laughs> oh, I know, it's like, uh, would, you li would you like to sleep in late? And would you like a second cup of coffee? All the things we always answer yes to. But we're starting to look at it and say, do we need to transport everybody? Do we need to take them to an emergency department? And if we don't take them there, where do we take them? Do they have to go at all? All right. Um, Time out for a factoid. Yeah. How many people per day in this country are turning 65 each and every day? Take a guess. Throw a number. 10,000. Ah, she knew the number. That's wow. it. It's 10,000. 10,000 people every day between now and the end of 2029, as the baby boom generation will turn 65. Who needs an ambulance more than anybody? Well, yes, there's a trauma. We know about trauma. We know about young kids. But the nursing homes, the sick people at home, it's often people who are 65 plus. Hey, Ray, how you doing? Very good, sir. I haven't I seen have Ray in a while. Nice. See, it's I good to know your audience. Emergency. Yeah. <laughs>
So that's a number that says, gee, what about the people that have the types of problems that older people have, the mobility problems, the information problems, the access problems, the follow-up problems? Oh, I'm talking too much. You're next. Oh, yeah. <laughs> have we had enough with this slide? Do you want to see more? All in favor of seeing more, say aye. Aye. <coughs> okay. Those guys have it. There we go. All right. So let's start thinking about it. Thinking about a new evolving kind of community-based care plan. And more importantly, taking you providers outside of what you are currently uh, doing and your current scope of practice. Okay, this is not for the burnt out paramedic who's grouchy and growling and you know can't stand going to work and hates the human race. This is somebody who actually likes people, has experience, and you have to have experience to start thinking about who to put in this position. You don't know a disease until you've seen the disease presented a hundred different ways. Then you know that one disease. That takes time, that takes experience. Experience is what's in this room. Like I said, we have no kids in this room. The young kids are out there. They're, they should be in school right now. Probably. Yeah. That's okay. My kid's in school. He's going to pick my nursing home, so he has to get smart. Thank you. I got a chuckle up here. That was <laughs> it's a tough crowd today. All right. Well, but, I don't understand. So you're a medic, and I feel sick at home, yeah. and you're busy with one of these mobile, immobile people that you're trying to give some care to, and then I call you because I have chest pain. Who's going to come get me? Well, this, this should not be taking away from 911 calls. This is an adjunct to the system. Ah. Okay. This is where we start integrating and actually bring EMS in as a provider of care, the care model. Come on. Oh, oh, yeah. that's, that's not until slide 12, I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we, we got 40 minutes to go here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, but we also have to play well with others. So we're going to bring other practitioners in, maybe even working with nurses, uh, nurse practitioners, PAs, bring them in because there are some skill sets that they will bring in to the management of the patients. More importantly, it's also looking at when is the care needed. You know what? If I have a stuffy nose, and I think I need to go to see a provider, and it's 10 o'clock in the morning, pretty much any urgent care is open, and I can walk in and be seen. Or I can call 911 for my stuffy nose and be transported. And you'd be lying if you told me you didn't transport somebody who at some time has a stuffy nose. We've done it. Why? Why? Let's go back to funding. How do you get paid in EMS? And what will insurance pay? Transport only. So, but we'll get back to that on slide 12. How many of you have ever had a patient with uh, low blood sugar where they refused transport? And most of the time when you sat down with them and talked about it, maybe there was another family member there, you were able to feel pretty good once they signed off, right? You didn't feel like you were leaving them to die. You felt like, okay, they recovered. I hung out a little bit. I gave him some education. Do you have a question? Well, no, but I say it's much more difficult when you have that low blood sugar patient who is typically the most satisfying male to provide because you can see a marked difference. Yeah. And they say after the third time you've been there in two weeks, and do you mind transporting me this time, even though I went from storing to talking to me? Right. Because if you transport me, I pay a $50 copay. If you don't, your company bills me $500 and my insurance for Hey, yeah. How do you argue with that? Exactly. How do you argue with somebody who says, I'm here because my family doctor said I need an MRI. My insurance won't pay for an MRI unless it's an emergency. And my family doctor told me to go to the ER to get the MRI. <laughs> and by the way, I have no money to pay you, but you're an ER doctor, so it doesn't really matter. So, <laughs> right? so I mean, there, there are disparities among patients insurance companies, by the way, what's a provider? Anybody know the definition of a provider since we keep using that word? Provider is a, a professional that can see a patient for health care, send the bill legally, and be paid for their services. So that means that a nurse practitioner is a provider, a PA in certain circumstances is a provider, um, a physician's a provider. 
So uh, that, that's how that works. Uh, so a, a, a nurse who's providing bedside care is not called a provider because they don't send the bill. The hospital sends the bill for them. But it just goes to show sometimes the most important person on the team is not the provider. It's, it is team. There is some reimbursement for paramedic assists for for, yes, there is for certain things for you know getting them back into bed, and but then again there could be uh, there could be a disparity as to whether you're allowed to bill beyond what the insurance company pays, and that's a whole nother discussion that's called out of network and balanced billing, and we're going through that. In my own profession, there are companies where somebody comes from out of state. Maybe they come from New York to to Lehigh Valley, and I want to charge them a uh, hundred dollars for suturing their two-inch laceration on their arm. But their insurance company says, hey, you're out of network, we'll just send you 30 bucks. So then technically we were allowed to send the bill for the other 70. There are some states that are now outlawing those uh, balanced billing. And part of the reason that some states have gotten into that is because there's also some physicians who are a little bit, uh, I won't use the word dishonest, but they're certainly over ebullient in sending their bill and maybe instead of charging $100 for that, which might be fairly standard, 80, 100, 120, all within the range, maybe somebody sends a bill for 900 and wants the balance bill. And n none of us who are ethical would support that. But you know, you only need two or three percent of, of the people to do that to get the rest of us in hot water. Mm -hmm. Are we still talking about the same subject? We are, but I okay. can pull us back because you did a factoid on the last one. How about a factoid on this one? How about where there's a lack of care? What percentage of physicians practice in a rural area? What, give me a number for not many. You can go a little higher than 7%. Probably about 10%. I'll take 10%. How many people in the United States live in a rural area? Probably about 75. Not quite that much, but flip it, 25%. Now, are there enough practitioners take care of the patients. So there's a gap. Hmm. Maybe utilizing providers, because I'll bet there's some medics, paramedics that are out in the uh, rural areas that could fill into this role. So again, start morphing your idea as to where it's going. Filling gaps. When I arrived to the public health service in 1982 in Sullivan County, Pennsylvania, I was the only doctor that lived in the county. 400 square miles, I did house calls, Red Rock Job Corps Center, two nursing homes that I directed, and there were no other doctors that lived in the county. They now have, and for the last 10 years, they finally have paramedics and no medics. I made the unique rule that when you're on call there and you, you, know, you can run as an EMT, you can't have alcohol in your breath when the doctor's in the ambulance. But to, to quote my friend Joe, the retired teacher, how do we know we get called out tonight? So. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. For this purpose? Well, currently, we're going to keep that as a paramedic. Who knows what could happen? <clears throat> All right. So th there's some other stuff. What, what if, I'll give you another what if. What if you had a heart attack and you went home, and uh, now it's about three and a half weeks later from any of the hospitals around here, and maybe you saw your family doctor who decided you could cut back on your Lasix a little bit, which is a water pill, of course, or maybe you never were put on Lasix, but you had some troubles and actually they didn't realize that your heart isn't pumping as strongly as it should, and now you start to get swollen ankles and you get short of breath, so you call an ambulance. If it's somebody who's known to have congestive heart failure in the past and maybe they enjoyed drinking the pickle juice after they ate the pickles, I know people who do that, or maybe they did cut back on their Lasix, must they in every case come to the emergency room? Or if they had somebody with the proper education and some testing and maybe telemedicine contact, would there be a way to keep that person in the home? So I'm not looking for an answer yet. We're gonna talk about some of these things and try and get you talking a little bit more as we go through the lecture, the presentation, excuse yeah. me. But you see where we'd have to build that, because currently you couldn't do anything because Lasix is off of the uh, state medical list, right? So we may have to change that if we want to continue. All right. You don't get a cape and get to fly on your own, okay? You're still working under the uh, medical control of a physician. But it's not to say that that's any change, because currently a lot of protocols are physician regulated, command is physician regulated, 
So it's not much of a change. What it is, though, is a closer working relationship with the physicians, the emergency physicians, but also the patient's own primary care provider, their own primary physician. So consultation may actually include calling their family doc and saying, hey, I want to do this, that, because I have found this. Utilizing uh, telemedicine and actually letting them see their patient. What's up, Jake? in areas where there are visiting nurses and the people meet the criteria for uh, coverage under visiting nurses. Not all people make that uh, point. And, and that's actually where it's uh, uh, pointed towards, the folks that are not able to be covered by visiting nurses because that's, you don't want to take business away from the nurses. I am married to a nurse. Never piss off a nurse. <laughs> okay. When my dad had a stroke, he lived with us for nine months, as long as we could take care of him until he ended up in a nursing home and passed away a few months later. It was a really bad stroke. But we had home health care, and they came into the house. But you had to make an appointment. I mean, they had their rounds, so you would know they would come every so often. They'd be checking on whether it's the Foley or the medication or whether we were abusing him or all the things that a home health care nurse does. But that's not the same as on an emergency basis semi-scheduled, it might be, hey, we're having a problem, okay, it's 10 in the morning, we'll get there at 2 o'clock this afternoon. But to take training, and it's not the training that you have alone, it would be you, the training that you currently have would be the base, the foundation upon which you would build on to get specific disease management education, <laughs> specific communication education, specific protocols for how you would interact with a physician, and specific protocols for what else could you do besides arrive at a hospital emergency department? See, I would have been afraid to give this lecture 10 years ago because I don't want to cut out my business and I, I love dealing with people and I do have a mantra, bring me anything. I'm not one of these people that says that's not an emergency, why'd you come? It's like if you have a hangnail, bring it to me. I'm perfectly happy to take care of you. That's what I got into it for. But if there's going to be 10,000 people a day turning 65, we've got to take this slope of how many more people are going to come into the ER and lower it we're not going to lose business, but if we, can, if we can keep the business reasonable, every time we don't have to build another emergency room bed, we've saved like two, three million dollars. So when somebody says, oh yeah, we're good to add, and, and look, I do this at my own place. They go, why don't we just add 20 beds? And they go, sure, you got 60 million in your pocket? So um, th then you start to say, oh, is there something we can do that might cost a million or two, but it won't cost 60 million? And uh, so that's where these ideas came up, and it does require more education and more cooperation and more integration. So um, I don't know. Do you want do you want to talk a little bit about these four things here? Yeah. Oh, sure. Finance. <laughs> Thanks. Sure. You talk about the money. <laughs> All right. Here's the thing. Kind of touched on it earlier that a lot of pay is tied to your transport. But if the, leg if the uh, legislation gets involved and start to say, these practitioners can go out, treat the patient, and can be reimbursed. Currently, there's nothing that says Medicare, Medicaid, or any of the private insurers have to pay. There is some legislation, there are some grants, state grants, local grants that support these programs, the ones that are up and running. Um, and I said, when I saw this, Pennsylvania is actually on there. Yeah, I'm not sure where in Pennsylvania. Pittsburgh, yeah. Pennsylvania. Pittsburgh's yeah. doing one. Yeah, I, I did the research for them. Yeah, because I read about uh, Danielle Wall Street Journal did an article okay. on the Geisinger program. Yeah, and um, Jefferson has a program they presented at the telemedicine conference in Santa Barbara. Geisinger has a program. I know they're too. Yeah. yeah, Jefferson's really big in, into telemedicine, and of course they have Judd Hollander, who they hired, and Judd is an emergency physician who's uh, vice president of entrepreneurship in the emergency department. And uh, Jefferson has hired people with connections to government, like Brendan Carr, who I helped him get his Washington job. They have people who are connected to the insurance companies and the pharma, pharma companies, like Charlie Pollock. They have Judd Hollander who's connected to pharma and other places. And one of our medical students, Alexandra Prince, actually was working as a, uh, one of the directors of telemedicine at Jefferson before she came over to become a medical student. 
So yeah, there's all sorts of stuff flying around. Yeah. But, but there's other things about medicine. Did you guys know that hospitals are not supposed to be paid by Medicare if they readmit somebody who's been there in the last 30 days for something similar? It may not even be that similar. Maybe I broke my hip and I go home 10 days later and then I get a urinary tract infection and somewhere they can document I had a Foley for 12 hours. Mm -hmm. And now I get a urinary tract infection and I have to go back into the hospital on day 20. And it costs four days of hospitalization and $40,000. That would be cheap for four days these days. Yeah. And uh, guess what? Medicare says, you eat it. You're the one who caused this, whether you did or not. Well, gee, if there was some other method that only cost us $1,000 for a visit and another $1,000 for follow-up care, we just saved $38,000. Mm -hmm. Or maybe the insurance company, if it's something not even a readmission, says, oh, well, you mean we might be able to take this person who never filled their antihypertensive medication when they got discharged after their stroke and because they had trouble you know, getting a ride from the mobile home park out to the pharmacy eight miles away and they don't drive anymore and their wheelchair doesn't fit in the back of their, uh, of their Volkswagen and they're going, oh my goodness, they didn't take their medicine. I mean, I had somebody like this and it wasn't that they purposely skipped their medicine, but two days ago they were supposed to get a scope from the GI doctor. And they said, well, don't take any meds that morning. So they go to the GI lab and their blood pressure is, and this is a real number, 257 over 124. And she was 78 years old. So, you know, you can blow a, a gasket when you're that high if you're 78. You might let a young person go for a few hours that way, but not an older person. So we take care of her blood pressure, we get it all under control in four hours, and she goes home. But if I could get it under control in four hours, if something like that happened at home, maybe somebody could avoid some of it because you would be there to educate. You need to get these meds. By the way, on the way over, Mrs. Jones, I stopped at the pharmacy and picked up your prescription for you. That's true. You know, and going back to the patient themselves, that it's not a matter of uh, an obstacle to get to the medication, but how about what am I doing with this medication? Honestly, how many of you have asked what medications you take? A uh, blue one, a pink one, a red one, and a white one. Uh-huh, okay, what, what are they for? I don't know. Okay, so how about patient education? Nurses in the room. How many of you still work the floor, work the floor? Used to work the floor. Still do, all right. Have you noticed how over the years your time with your patients for education is gone. Yeah, so where is the education coming from to the patients to say, this is your disease, these are your medications, this is what you're supposed to take, these are, this is why you're taking this medication. Teaching them, it takes time to do that. And currently, <coughs> it's move meat, move meat, move meat in the acute care setting. But in a different setting, there's the time for the education to bring that patient up to speed as to their disease and uh, why they are treating their disease. Dwayne, I want to share with you what, I, I took these off my printer, right? Mm -hmm. Look what was in the middle of my printer. Aren't I a good boy? You got your flu vaccine, nice. I got my flu, everybody here get their flu vaccine? This is a commercial, we're halfway through. Get your, get your flu vaccine, I got mine. In the emergency department, I do it a little different. I've learned over, you know, starting, oh, I'm gonna date myself. <laughs> Al and I used to be paramedics back in the 80s. That's when we started. And I learned about the, do you have any medical problems? No. You have a whole list of medicines. Well, yeah, I take that for my pressure, that for my sugar, that for, okay, I don't do that anymore. And when I teach, I say, give me your medications. And I actually will go through the medications because I'm usually in the room before the med collection tech gets in there. And I want to know what kind of education base I'm working with my, with my patients. So I say, all right, you're on lisinopril. You take that for your blood pressure. You're on uh, micronase. You know, and I go through each and every one of them. And if I get the deer in the headlights look, great. So I have some work to do. And you know, anybody who knows me, I pull up the trash can, sit on the trash can, and we have a grand old, it's got a lid on it. 
Okay. But I have a conversation with our patients, and that's my education for them. This is my hobby. If it was a job, I'd quit. Family doctors used to see three or four patients an hour. Now they're told they have to see six or seven patients an hour. Okay, so it, it is what is happening when the nurses have time. Uh, the nurses also have pretty high ratios at times, not just in the hospital, but anywhere. Everywhere we go, we're busy. So the electronic health record has really helped us. I can tell what, what happened last week. But here's the other thing that happens. We see people who are 89 years old, and the electronic health record has the Encyclopedia Britannica with it. So what we really need almost is a secretary or a scribe to go through all that data and then tell us what's in there because we too only have so much time. So yeah, it's incumbent upon a patient, whether they're using the web or the materials they're given, to, to uh, try and educate themselves. And here's a real story. I'm in the ER one day, and uh, one of my residents, I'm watching, just for, actually it was before we had a residency, I think it was one of my partners, was giving really great instructions to this lady. She had a big pocketbook. Um, she was probably between 65 and 75, and she was going, uh-huh, yep, I understand. And then I saw her go like this with the paper and then put it in her pocketbook. And just for the heck of it, it took her about 15 steps to come to me, and I said, ma'am, hi, I'm Dr. Rosenau. I work here, too. Oh, hi. Uh, how are you doing? I'm okay. Did they treat you nicely? Yes, they treated me very nicely. Do you have to take any medicine when you go home? Uh, I'm not sure. Well, did anybody give you any instructions about what to do when you leave here? And remember, this all happened 18 seconds before. And she goes, nobody told me a thing. Just imagine the press gainy on that one. That's, that's a, our evaluation of whether we are nice doctors or not. My, my mother-in-law had emergency surgery at Lehigh Valley. And eight weeks later, a press gainy survey comes to her. And she goes to my wife, Robin, it says here, did the doctor explain everything? I don't think they told me anything. And I'm, going, I'm having a heart attack. And I said, Mom, do you remember the surgeon? He came in, he got down like this so that you were eye to eye while you were laying there with incarcerated her and talking to you and went through everything. Oh, yeah. I said, give him a five. She goes, oh, I'll give him a ten. I said, it only goes up to five. So, <laughs> so that's what happens. Or somebody's grand niece. But do this test on yourself. Next time, God forbid, I hope you're never a patient, but next time you're a patient and you're in pain and the doctor gives you instructions uh, and takes a history from you, see if you remember to tell them about that appendix that was taken out 20 years before. <coughs> see if you remember to tell them that you had a bad infection in your leg or a broken bone in your ankle. You'd be surprised how all the knowledge of your own history flies out of your head when you're in pain and you don't absorb. It's, you're just not tuned in at that moment. <laughs> Four beer cans. Okay, that works. That gentleman had a question for you, Dwayne. So can I ask your, both your opinions sure. back up to something that you said about accountable health care <laughs> and the 30 day readmission? All the programs that I'm familiar with in the Commonwealth are run by hospitals. They're not getting reimbursed, however, they are saving them. So is the goal of community care medicine to keep people out of hospitals or to keep them at home? Does that, does that difference make sense? Yes, it does. And the, you, when we come to later in here, we're going to tell you about some of the goals. But the goal, and we're emergency physicians, so there's a slide that says the medical directors take. We're going to get to that. But we really don't believe that the purpose of this is to keep people out of the ER. Because the ER is one of the cheapest places you can go for real care. What's, when you get a belly pain and you go to your family doctor, what do they do? They examine you and they say, go here and get your lab work. And then you come and take this medicine. Then you come back five days later, have the medicine work. Well, not so well. Okay, go here and go get your uh, CAT scan as an outpatient. They'll schedule it 10 days from now. Meanwhile, you've missed four or five days of work, which has a cost. But the problem with why we are viewed as expensive is that we make the most expensive decision. So you could come to the ER and it could cost you, I think, I've seen, Slides that say the average cost of going to the ER is 900. I've seen ones that say the average cost is 9,000. 
But somewhere between 900 and 9,000 is, is the truth. However, the government will show you slides that if we make the decision to keep you in the hospital, the cost is 10 times that, it's 90,000. So we're actually the keepers of the most terrible decision that a person has to make as stewards of the community. Do I spend 90,000 because I have to be in the hospital or 9,000? And also, while I'm making that decision, if I want to sort of, I think I can keep somebody home, but there's a two or three percent chance something will go wrong, and I might get sued for 500,000, mm -hmm. and there's no defense. Hmm. You're up. Wow. Oh, I got a new slide. Uh, I got a new slide up there. <laughs> All right. I, th I think there's a couple good words. Oh yeah. Collaborative. Wow. All right, I mean, each community is going to have their own version. You know, a, a, an urban setting is going to be different than a rural, which is going to be different than a suburban setting. And so each community is going to have to look at what are our needs. So an assessment has to be done to figure out how we are going to target this kind of a program. Most important thing, you got to be able to say, does it make a difference? And so collection of data is going to be necessary. And it's a matter of providing evidence-based medicine you know, to prove that we did decrease hospitalizations. We did drop the readmission rate. We did help folks obtain a, an A1C level that is less than double digits. So, Yeah, or, or if, if St. Luke's and Lehigh Valley and a couple other hospitals all end up using EPIC, and they do a search and find out that last year we saw 600 people with hypoglycemia and 400 of them were due to insulin, which is not quite as bad as the pills because the pills to hypoglycemia can go on. You have to observe the person for a few hours and so on. And then they go, oh, well, maybe there's something we can target with community paramedicine for those 400 people to save, you know, maybe 250 of those 400 visits. So you can hear, as we're talking to you, we're, we're trying to give you some insights into the medical system, what's going on in the ER. You've heard some comments from our, our, our nurse, nursing, uh, uh, fellow nur uh, nursing professionals back there. And uh, these are a couple other good words. I think that's probably the most important line there. patient center. It's not about us. We know where we're at. We're, we're going to be in the emergency department. It's not about you. People are going to call you. You're going to go treat your patients. It really, this program, it has to be patient-centered. It is to improve the patient. Improve them in their management of their disease process, their education, their understanding, and most importantly, their lives. Because you take that congestive heart failure patient that spirals back in. I usually refer to it as a revolving door diagnosis. You're going to come in, get tuned up. You're going to go out, you're going to decompensate. You're going to come back in, get tuned up, go out. But each time, they're just a little worse. And they slowly get eaten away by the disease process. Keeping them out, keeping them under control, is better for their lives. There's a guy named Jeff Brenner who's a family, I'll come to you right after the story. He's a family practitioner in New Jersey, in Camden. And they discovered that they had like 100 patients that were making 5% of all the visits to the emergency room in Camden. I mean, just like 100 people. And they found out that 80% of those people came from Northwood, which was a uh, reduced cost housing unit. And you think, oh, what's the matter with these people? They have all the dummies gathered in one place? But no, that's not the truth. Jeff Brenner, uh, MD, used uh, census data to target what census tract these patients matched up with, and then what building they matched up with, and then found out well, what happens when you're in a wheelchair and the elevator breaks in the building? You can't get downstairs to get to a taxi to go to the doctor. What happens when it's the second or third time that you missed your clinic appointment? The clinic says, you can't be our patient anymore. You're not reliable. Well, it's hard to be reliable when you don't have legs, right? So there, there were some terrible things. And, and these were people who were poor. So a snack wasn't a peach. By the way, have you seen how much a peach or an apple or a piece of fruit costs? If you have four kids at home and you're going to buy fruit for the week for four kids, it's an incredible amount of money these days. And uh, so potato chips take the place for the snack. And people get heavy, they get fat, the insulin makes you heavier in some cases. 
So what they did is they put an NP, a nurse practitioner, in that building. And they found that they cut the emergency department visits by 80, 90 percent. Now, I heard that since then there's some changes and there's not a nurse practitioner there anymore. I don't know what it is now, but for that study period of time, they dramatically reduced the people like the patient I used to have once a day, Ray. Some of you may have transported once a day, Ray. Okay, not you, not this Raymond. I don't want to say anything bad about you. But I actually sat down with one. I, I was doing my Dwayne Sabursky imitation. I sat down with the patient. I was kind. I was compassionate. I explained that I think he'll be able to go home, but I need to do a test called the troponin. He says, you don't need all that blood work. Don't you know who I am? And I said, no, who are you? He said, I'm once a day Ray. Just do an EKG, and then you can send me on my way. <laughs> now, here's the thing. We have our frequent flyers or super users is, I guess, the more PC term. That's what they're called, super utilizers. All right, so San Antonio looked at it, and they had a very low number, 21 super users, making 800 visits in a 12-month period. Ambulance charges alone, $950,000. I didn't say what the reimbursement was, just said what they charged. Well, 800 visits times, yeah. yeah. Right. But what they did was a, t a program in Texas targeted those super users and met their needs so that looking at it a year later, looking at the data, proving that this has merit, decreased the uh, call volume to the point of, in these super users, their ambulance uh, charges were $50,000. What else is in San Antonio? Anybody know? Probably the highest concentration of military of anywhere in the country. There's like 150,000 uh, of, our, of our military, uh, of mostly, I think, Army Marines. I don't think there's a Navy in San Antonio. They do have a little river going behind the hotel there. The river it's very nice. The river walk. There's a Navy, there's a Navy uh, base there that uh, does their special operations. Okay, so like SEALs type stuff. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Lackland, okay, there we go. So, what do military people do on the weekend? He knows. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, actually, San Antonio has something called sobriety centers now. And the people know, man, if you get in the car and you drive drunk, they're going to throw the book, they'll throw two books at you. But if you call up and say, ding a ling a ling, hey, uh, my pal's here and he's had like 99 beers and, uh, He's not winning at darts anymore. They go, oh, well, that's really serious. So uh, they'll actually pick him up. They'll bring him to a sobriety center. They'll start an IV. They'll give fluids. They have to give a little medicine. And then 12 hours later, you can go home. No ER visit. No, no hooskow, as long as you're not violent. And so it's something that I don't think Allentown needs a sobriety center, although they could use the psychiatric evaluation center, um, because we just have much more. It, there was a set of articles. I know it, it sounds funny, but a set of articles that the American College of Emergency Physicians worked with a reporter from USA Today. And it was a beautiful set of three, four articles. There's a need for 510,000 beds, psychiatric beds in the country, but there's only 110,000. Where are the rest of the beds? Under the railroad bridge, out in the forest you know, out behind the AMP. Uh, well, the AMP doesn't exist anymore, I guess, the Wegmans. Mm -hmm. You had a question and I skipped over you. I'm so sorry. Uh, sorry. Um, the, the business model, it is a business. Does the business model change when you have a hospital that has paramedics attached versus a hospital that does not have paramedics attached? And then the other component there is, this is all wonderful, but I don't see the incentive for the hospital. I don't see the incentive for the ambulance I just figured out something. They want to hear the rest of our lecture. They do. Yeah. Give us about four more slides and all will be illuminated. Okay. We sort of did it a little bit backwards because we didn't want to give you the whole story on one slide at the front and they go, oh, and now they're going to tell us it's team based and data driven. Yeah. We're building up. But yes, sir. But we're talking about education for the providers. Yes. And that would take time. Yes. Right. For something like this to work, do you have to target a 
I'll give you the best example. I think I know your question. The question is, it's 1966 and you have a heart attack and nobody can transport you to a hospital which has like a two bed emergency room because there's really no such thing. The family doctor does Monday and Thursday nights and the surgeon does Tuesdays and Fridays. The der dermatologist comes in on the weekend to do a shift in the ER. There's, there's no board certified emergency doctor and they call up, uh, they call up the funeral home because they have the, the, the long and they have the Ghostbusters car that can transport you. That was EMS in 1966. And then the Department of Transportation came out with their famous stuff and the American Academy of Orthopedics came out with the first trauma courses. They actually were the beginnings of, we didn't have trauma surgeons, we had orthopods then. And uh, so th the bottom line is we had to educate people and then there was this new workforce that was taught by some of the pioneers, some, some guy named George Moorkirk who, who said uh, along with Don Gaylor, and Don Gaylor was I'll be the inside guy, you be the outside guy. And those, those two surgeons got together and brought EMS to Allentown, Bethlehem, Easton area. And uh, so, yes, it didn't exist though. The community had to be educated and then there had, to be, there had to be fights in the legislature for money. And there were fights as recently as less than 10 years ago where we tried to get the 911 centers to be able to pinpoint where somebody is when they make a phone call. So all these things are actually in evolution. So you're right. The purpose of this is to inform you of something that doesn't exist here but is starting to exist in certain places and it may be useful. And here's the next slide that begins the beginning of the most important five slides or so that we have for you. And Dwayne, you can tell me to shut up if I'm talking too much. Yeah, I mean, I'm fine. I, I dealt with Sorrentino this morning. Oh, well, that's, I, yeah, geez, I'm hardly talking at all. We didn't then. get a word in edgewise with him. <laughs> 40 minutes later. So, right. so, so you were talking about this a little bit before. Maybe you want to talk some more about it. I was. <laughs> so, yeah, so I mean, here it is. I mean, how many folks were starting to think, uh, you know, what, I'm going to build my own, my own model. Where did your model go? I mean, you start thinking about the patients. Uh, do you take them after they get out and discharge? Because you know what? If you were in the hospital watching that diabetic on the floor, their blood sugars are perfect. <clears throat> oh, man. And they go out and they go home and their blood sugars go crazy. Because I don't know what happens, but that 1,688 calorie diet at home is different. It's like three platters versus the one that's in the hospital. So Dwayne's from Reading, I'll remind you. <laughs> this is true. Fight my way in, shoot my way out. But how about the CHFers? You know, it, it's a matter of what's in the house. Yes, you know what, if somebody is delivering your food tray, they know how much sodium is on that food tray. They know how much fluid is on that food tray. When they get home, there's no monitoring. And it's like, I've always bought these potato chips. I've always bought these hot dogs. You know, so maybe somebody going in there and actually educating the patient. Well, there's that education word. My father-in-law had congested heart failure for the first time. For some reason, he drove down to the Syrian market in uh, Allentown, and he picked up two pounds of his favorite black olives, real salty. Oh. And his wife, my mother-in-law, didn't even know, and he was popping them. And then they came to visit us, and he went into CHF. He said, that damn doctor doesn't know what he's talking about. There's nothing wrong with my heart. I said, well, it's covered in olives. That's what the problem is. <laughs> All right. How about, uh, you know, going back to... Uh, home health nurses, how about the patients that don't have access or don't qualify for home health care nursing? Post-surgical, dressing changes, wound care. You know, there's only so much, there are some patients that maybe they can't reach their foot. I'm getting to the point where I can touch my toes still. Good, I'm done. <laughs> All right, so Excellent. there are people that cannot do their own wound care on their feet. Wouldn't that be an option? But then also, how about going back to the transport? If you're going to uh, send them, do we need to send them to the emergency department? Can they go to an urgent care? Can they go to a freestanding ER? Um, there are places that say, hey, you want detox? Okay, why can't we take you to a detox center? There are models out there like that. Uh, but again, reduce the readmission, because again, put that patient back in, they are exposed to risks, complications, and you know, the hospital would love it because the way the model plays, you readmit, you're not going to get reimbursed. Yeah, Chris. Just, just a little bit of your point, I think, about stakeholders, right? and I think the slide's purpose here was to try to delineate 
the various ways that people maybe have this in their brain. Mm -hmm. I think I think the first example is your is your hospital trying to prevent that 30 day transition right. scenario. Maybe, maybe in the next one, your stakeholder is your 911 system. Where 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 I know uh, is, it, is it Wayne County that, that or one of them that has it for site. Yep. The, the, the 911 get to is dispatched for a psychiatric patient, which probably doesn't need to go to the ER. They might need to just go to do another another destination. They'll send a community paramedic to pick that case up, which gets the 911 victim back on the street to handle other other things. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I think it, 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 it probably does depend on your brain. Like I think there's more than the stakeholders just public health. Just yeah, I, I want to thank you for saying that because there's something real important. It's not that the psychiatric patient isn't important. What's important, though, what you pointed out is it's matching the resource to the need. Yeah. So the mobile intensive care unit wasn't needed for the psych patient. Basically, a safe means of transport, hopefully, to the proper type of center was needed so that all this other equipment that can revive you if your heart stops can be used for that patient. So we have, there are uh, services available. Rhode Island has a very good pre-hospital psychiatric care. You know, right now, we have a level one psych center in the region. It's called Muhlenberg Hospital. It seems that every psych patient- Curse you, Dwayne. <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, we don't have a strong pre-hospital psychiatric, the, the uh, community psych <coughs> care is not as good around here. And unfortunately, they think that you just go to one site. I mean. There's a whole lot on that one. That's next year's lecture. <laughs> and uh, Dwayne, we're going to give you a plane ticket to the real Kalahari for that Ooh. comment. No. Uh, so anyway, we've got six slides left, and five of them lead up to the final one. And I want to leave three or four minutes for the final slide. So is it okay with you if we like zip through the next four slides in four minutes? We could ask them. All in favor of zipping, say aye. Aye. All aye, those okay. guys have it. There we go. So Dwayne was, Dwayne was trying to tell you that you need to assess the community. And there's some examples. You can read it for yourself. You have to know what your resources are. Like, we have really some of the best medical communication anywhere you go in the country. That we have. Communications are great. Telepresence is starting to be built out. We got docs who care. Uh, we got paramedics who uh, really spread across the six county area beautifully and are doing a great job in the 911 service. But again, you can't take a 911 medic and say, you're going to spend 20 minutes with this patient, and now you get toned out. Who do I choose? So there's going to have to be something that is attached to 911 because so much grows out of it. And that person can even be a further education specialist for the rest of the unit. Then you have what activities do we do, like that flu shot. I mean, my wife and her mom, my mother-in-law who lives with us who's 85, went to Target to get their shots. It's the best place in the world to get your shot. And if you got Medicare, you don't have to pay a penny. And uh, then you've got all the other things that are up there, including the sobriety centers. And then evaluation. What do we do? How do we look back on this and say, was there cost effectiveness? Did the insurance company say, we're really happy to pay $2 million a year to the ABE area to have this sort of service because it saves us $20 million. And that kind of stuff can happen. The hospital says, we're really happy to, to donate $150,000 a year from the hospital to this because it saved us $950,000. And you can see uh, that kind of math going on. And these are some of the essential features, uh, the partnerships, the patient-centered access, the communication. I mentioned telepresence, uh, sustainable funding, and where it comes from. And that's what's being figured out by some of these pilot programs that are going on. And then you look at how do you measure performance? You measure it from what does the patient think, what's going on on the clinical side, what's the provider experience in this case, what's your experience when you are providing care in the home. And we would never put you in the position of providing the care unless we either gave you the knowledge or, the, or uh, maybe a little bit lesser knowledge with great protocols to help you through so that you wouldn't look at a chf -er that has chest pain and has sweat on their brow and say, this one we can just give Lasix to, you'd say, oh, this one may be having another heart attack versus the one that just says, I've been getting a little more short of breath when I cut the lawn. My ankles are big like they were two days before I went into the hospital six months ago. Oh, maybe that one we can do that. And then finally, um, Dwayne, do you mind going through this just yeah. a little bit? I mean, first off, let's look at, if you look at most of those that are up there, You'll know the answer to this question. What is the number one diagnosis for readmission in the United States? Congestive heart failure. So 
with everything except uh, North Carolina, everybody's looking at that as one of their uh, impacts, reducing CHF emissions. Also, uh, decreasing the uh, super users, reducing CHF. Uh, hospice. Who feels comfortable with hospice and end-of-life care? I'd like to see all the arms up in the room, so you know what? If you want to get more comfortable, Dr. Vinti Shaw is going to be doing a presentation on uh, uh, palliative care. Get into it, because you know what? Along with, <coughs> along with 10,065 year olds a day, remember, we are living longer. But hospice is end of life care, and it's life with dignity. But it's a matter of we can integrate into that. So the uh, Fort Worth utilized that. Uh, I tried to rationalize why North Carolina didn't do CHF. I think everybody smokes down there, so it's all C COPD. But, you know, and you look at it, you know, how does it impact, and what's it impacting, and who is it impacting? Who would, you know, obviously EMS is on all of them, but call centers, you know, is it going to decrease the volume through the call centers? Is it going to impact the hospitals, and what kind of results, uh, patients coming in or readmitting the patients. Uh, also, impact with primary care and integrating pr primary care. You know, the old days of the three to four patients an hour is gone. Uh, I can honestly say that I'm gonna try to get an appointment with my primary care physician. It will be next January. That's how far out he is. They're packed. So, but maybe by integrating them and be bringing them as part of the model. You know what I'm so we got about three minutes left. Okay. And two slides. We can do this. Yeah. Yeah. How about you do this slide and I'll do this one? All right. So. These are final two slides. This is good Dr. Rose now said. We don't want to decrease our ER uh, visits. You know what? You come through the door, I'm going to see you. You're there for a reason. You're having what you think is a bad day. This is not going to decrease emergency department visits. Okay? But it's getting people to appropriate sites. What they need may not be at the emergency department. And it will be that provider making that decision to say, I need to take you to this site. Okay? Again, it is reducing readmissions, not from a financial standpoint, but from the patient's quality of life standpoint. The less times they get readmitted, the better they're going to be. And again, this is not to be um, the fill in for that. Uh, the other version of EMS earn money sleeping? No. This is an adjunct to 911. But it involves funding. And where is that funding coming from? How do you plan for it? Legislation has to get involved because you have to say this is a provider who can bill for these services. Uh, it is going to involve education. It's going to be taking an experienced provider and giving them more tools to take out, giving them a different skill set and developing protocols specific to a different type of uh, patient. That's actually the devil in the whole thing. That last bullet is the devil in how do you get this done. But remember 20 years ago, there were hardly any PAs. Nurse practitioners in the ER didn't really exist 15, 20 years ago. Uh, your profession that you're all sitting with didn't exist 50 years ago. Uh, so all these things had to start somewhere, and that's why we're talking to you about this. And this is sort of the money slide, and I don't have a laser pointer. So, um, anybody have a laser pointer? No. So, um, if you look at the current state at the bottom, a patient calls for help, 911. Through the process, you eventually get toned out, and EMS responds, and then you get transported. And almost by law, oh, thank you, almost by law, you have to be transported to the ED. But then this is what the model of a mobile integrated uh, health plan would be, uh, 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 with, uh, I'm sorry, health care practice would be. So MIMP gets called, MIHP gets called. I, I, I need new glasses, Dwayne. So, and yeah, most of these are going to go to the ED, but there's going to be some planning. It might be that every single person that gets discharged post surgically gets a third day visit from you because wind water wound. Wound is what gives you the infection the third day. Maybe you need to have a wound check on all these people. So that kind of thing might be in home care. Uh, it might be that, this, uh, that you're having your cellulitis treated, you'll need a change in drug, but you're doing okay, except that that redness isn't going down. 
and you haven't been able to get an appointment. Well, maybe, again, the mobile integrated healthcare practices, I think we can get you into, we, we have five offices in the city that have agreed to take patients from us. And then, of course, we talked about mental health, sobriety centers, and so on. So this becomes a little bit more of a hub. This could be the call center, it could be an individual unit, it could be something a town agrees on. Because remember, if you travel out to Montana, uh, you may be talking about uh, you know, 50 and 75 mile drives, or uh, short helicopter jumps, or fixed wing transport. So a lot of what we talked about is on this one slide. What's the problem? We don't achieve optimal health outcomes for the price. Uh, somewhere around 750 billion might represent waste because it's inefficient and there's another way to do it. Uh, that frustrates people and their doctors. So how do we bring health care to the patient? Without saying, no, we're not, we're not doing this to save money from the ED. The ED is 2% of the health care budget. AHRQ, all the data, have it on my slides. The government has shown that you get to have 140 million visits a year to the ED. All the time we save from people being out of work, all the diagnoses we get, everything we do is 2% of the health care budget. So, I, I love when there's a congressman in the office. When I spoke at the ACOEP, and Dwayne's on the board of ACOEP, that's a big deal. Uh, Joe Heck, who's a Nevada congressman, was in the second row. And I said, I've always dreamed about giving this lecture to a congressman. It's so great you're here to get CME, because he's a doctor and a congressman. So there's some proposed solutions. It goes back to everything that was on the previous slide. There's some essential features that involve education, communication, <laughs> and that devil called funding. There's a logical model that first you have to assess the community, find out what they need, what can be done, and if you do those things, what happens and what outcomes you'll get. There are examples to talk to or travel to, and so we have some conclusions. And those conclusions, I'll leave to my partner. Because oh, I have the, the good no, glasses. Because I've been talking too much and you have better glasses. All right. So here it is. You've been listening to us for the better part of an hour. I know you have a question. Well, we're governed by the Department of Health in Pennsylvania for licensing, but um, we have a tradition of volunteerism here. And, uh, and for this, though, you can see that insurance companies and hospitals have a big stake in this. It's just, can you keep it sustainable? You don't want somebody to give you a $500,000 grant and do this for six months. It's, can you get a buy-in to at least have a three-year pilot project and then keep the data that shows what you've saved or not? I'm talking as an expert who has not run one of these. So. <laughs> well, at least two of us. All right, so we're going to build a new framework. We're going to take you educate you, and let you go out and do something different. But we're going to adapt it to your region, your area, your locale. What are your needs? What can you provide? What you can't provide? And so it's a fluid model. And most importantly, there are multiple benefits. Yes, the hospitals benefit, the insurance companies benefit. No, let's get the finances out of the way. Who really benefits? the community because the patient's health is improved. Their longevity and their quality of life. It goes back to the one slide that I said, probably the most important, patient-centered. This all goes back to our patient. And if we can impact them, improve their quality of life, yeah, that's where probably the, the, we have the best job in the, uh, in the world. And I think that while there's multiple benefits, that one, going back to the patient, is the most important. And, and I'll just mention one other thing that we always have to remember because we both come from places where we have to show how we're doing with finances and what's reasonable and what can be afforded and what's appropriate. But your patients don't know that you're sitting here getting more knowledge and taking your time to be here. They'll never know you're doing that. They don't know about our CME. They don't know that we're making budgets and we have to go and take uh, ACLS and ATF. They don't know any of that. But that's okay because in the end, the only thing the patient's interested in is I'm in distress. I either have anxiety because of my pain or because of fear or I have a real disease. And usually the two go together. I, I, in fact, I tell my neighbors, every patient 
has the same diagnosis that I treat. It's called anxiety. Sometimes I cure it by talking to them. Sometimes I cure it by having a surgeon come in and take their appendix out. But in the end, as human beings, we're scared about what's happening to us or our family members. What counts more than anything, the reason we do all this stuff, and even though we joke about it, is for our patients. Because there would be no money for this education, for this research, and for what we do. And we wouldn't be able to do it unless we had the prime directive, which is take care of your patients, first do no harm, and see how you can make things better for the next generation. So Dwayne and I are thrilled that you took your time to listen to us. You had a lot of other choices, and we really appreciate that you joined us today.